just like the Admiral, I uh, have notes because I spent a lot of time with Pete over the many years we were together. And I've heard those stories sometimes several times, and I, but I never tired of them. And I heard a lot of other ones in addition to that. And it was, uh, uh, it was, it was a real pleasure to, uh, to be that close to him, that he would share that information. Because as a SEAL, and it was so secret what he did, that I was a little concerned that he would have to kill me at some point in time. <laughs> Please excuse my voice. I spent a week with my grandchildren, and of course, that results in a cold. So, <laughs> Peter Edmonds Riddle, as you know, was a high achiever, a man of many accomplishments, aware of many hats. Depending on the setting, he was regularly called Captain Riddle, Judge Riddle, Your Honor, Dad, Granddad. I was and am very proud to have called him my friend. In fact, Pete was more than a friend. He was in many ways part of our family. In our family, Pete was called Igor, a name that he picked for himself. I think it had something to do with mythology and his size. He was our friend for over 40 years and part of the Pete family for almost that length. Pete and his two amazing daughters, Catherine and Susan, were always welcome in our home. There are many yardsticks by which Pete could be measured, such as a military officer and combat veteran, an athlete, a lawyer, a judge. I choose to measure Pete as a devoted father, as a family man. I do not think one could have been more conscientious and devoted father than Pete was to his two daughters and later on to his grandchildren. Whenever we were together, the first topic of conversation was a sit rep. Those not in the military, that's a situation report. <laughs> on his children and grandchildren, and on my children and grandchildren. I think this spoke volumes about his priorities. Only after we had both caught up on all of this important information did we delve into topics of other interest. Our lives were interwoven for from the early 70s. We had much in common, both veterans of the Vietnam War, Pete as a SEAL and I as a Marine. We were recent law school graduates, busy raising a family in Coronado with a strong interest in the community. Pete twice served on our local city council. For a while, we were both coaching our children's soccer teams. We practiced on the same field. And at the end of the last practice of the week, we would hold a scrimmage between Pete's girls team and my team. As coaches, we had a side wager that the losing coach would have to do push-ups. <laughs> Thankfully, Pete was usually the losing coach. <laughs> and he'd hop down, he'd whip off at least 70 push-ups without stopping, to the amazement of the players and the other coaches, and the relief of me. <laughs> For many years, we ran together almost every morning. We would check in with each other in the evening, and Pete would announce he would be standing tall in front of my house at 0500. I always responded, how else could you be standing? <laughs> with that, he would let out a belly laugh, even though we had done it hundreds of times. You can learn a lot about a person when running for miles early in the morning. We talked most of the way. Sometimes one of us would complain and threaten to take off our pack as our way of being funny. Pete would tell stories about his days playing high school baseball as a catcher in Chicago, or about the time he, wrote, he broke the uh, Reverend Jesse Jackson's nose while playing intramural football when they were both at the University of Chicago. One particular story was touching. In 1968, after law school, Pete was a member of Governor Nelson Rockefeller's presidential campaign staff. On that terrible day in Los Angeles when Robert Kennedy was assassinated, Governor Rockefeller asked Pete to go to the Kennedy family. 
and he joined up with L.A. Rams star Roosevelt Greer, and the two of them were there to assist and help protect the Kennedy children during that very troubling time. Interestingly, we spoke very little about our respective times of Vietnam. When Pete mentioned it, it was usually to point out that when they wanted to know how deep a river or stream was, <laughs> they would send Pete out <laughs> to act as a human depth gauge <laughs> because he was always the tallest. However, he did speak often and fondly of the SEAL training, which you have heard from his teammate, Admiral Iris Flynn. During our friendship, Pete was a bachelor for a number of years. We had many talks about that difficult time in his life, but there was always one constant. He always kept his focus on Catherine and Susan and on being the best father possible. It was during these many years of being a single parent that Igor really became a part of our family. I think my wife, Chris, and our four sons were more responsible for that than I. Pete enjoyed being around four rambunctious boys. He frequently commented that we lived on the edge of chaos, and he loved it. And to top it off, Chris is an amazing cook, and Pete can put away food. They were quite a combination. Pete always had impeccable timing. Just by happenstance, Pete would drop by to visit just as Chris was cooking up a mound of blueberry or banana pancakes. Her eyes would light up as Pete would come in to the kitchen because even though she was cooking for four boys, a husband, and usually a foreign exchange student, with Igor there, she'd get to make at least two more batches of pancakes. <laughs> During this time with our four boys, we had multiple sporting events every Saturday. It was our goal to make sure we attended all of them. Pete would frequently jump in and volunteer to cover one or more games. On one occasion, our oldest son, Bill, was playing in a JV football game. And Pete was there with our son, Brian, because Chris and I were traveling to Monterey. During the game, Bill suffered a very severe fracture to his upper arm and shoulder. In typical fashion, Pete immediately took charge, putting Bill and Brian in his car and driving to the emergency room. He then got a hold of Chris's brother, an orthopedic surgeon, who operated on Bill that evening. In the meantime, Pete contacted us once we arrived in Monterey and stayed with Bill until we got back about one o'clock the next morning. He was our Igor. However, on occasion, Igor's help was not always fully appreciated. <laughs> For years, Pete's daughters would babysit our boys when we went to Sunday afternoon Charger games. Pete inevitably, inevitably came along to help. One afternoon, we got home, and the house looked fine as we walked through it until we got to the kitchen. One of us looked up, and we saw these black streaks across the <laughs> ceiling of the kitchen. So we asked the boys, what caused these black streaks? And they said, oh, Igor was holding Douglas, that's our youngest, upside down so he could walk along the ceiling. <laughs> He was 6'5", I mean, you know, he could do that. Dad couldn't do that so easily. <laughs> Pete used to participate in a triathlon called the Super Frog, which was primarily for active and former SEALs. On one Monday morning run after a Super Frog, I asked Pete how he had done it. He was crestfallen. By the time he had finished the swim portion, just about everyone else was long out of the water and on their bikes. Pete took off down the strand on his bike and got a flat tire, and it took him forever to repair it. Then on to the run. He said that by the time he finished the run, they were taking down the finish line down. <laughs> Most of the contestants had gone home, and they were sweeping up the empty beer cans. Although we didn't say so, I knew he would take steps to make himself more competitive. A few weeks later on a run, he tells me he had a very embarrassing incident happen to him the day before. In order to improve his swimming, he decided to swim from North Island to the Amphib Base, parallel to the beach here in Coronado. As he drew abreast of the Central Beach Lifeguard Tower, a lifeguard came out 
and asked him if he was all right. <laughs> Apparently, while watching Pete swim, the lifeguard grew concerned that he was drowning. <laughs> I think it was that incident that caused Pete to join the master swimming program <laughs> at UCSD under the tutelage of Sicky, whom you will hear from later. For me personally, it was a loss because swim practice was in the morning and I lost my running partner, but not my friend. For Peter, it was great. He became an accomplished competitive swimmer and met Betsy, his wife. In the 1980s, with the election of George Dumasian, George Dumasian as governor, Pete was one of a handful of people the governor relied upon to make recommendations for judicial appointments to the state courts for the county of San Diego. For at least a couple of years, Pete would come by and urge Chris and I to apply for appointment to the Superior Court. We consistently told him thanks, but no thanks. Pete persisted, and I finally changed my heart and my mind on that issue and with the help of Pete, was appointed to our local Superior Court. Chris persisted for another year and a half and then finally capitulated and also was appointed. About, after a, about a year after I was appointed, Pete came to me for a career counseling session. Pete had a cadre of three or four people that he would seek advice from for career and life decisions. You see, Pete had this philosophy that one needed to be repotted every so often. So about once a decade, Pete would come and seek my advice. Since he wanted to be repotted, I considered myself more of an advisory horticulturalist <laughs> than really a career counselor. In 1987, Pete sought my advice on seeking a judicial appointment himself. He was not a trial attorney, having specialized in probate and estate planning. Since I thoroughly enjoyed my first few months on the bench, I advised Pete to go for it but cautioned that because he was, he was not a career trial attorney, there could be a steep learning curve. To rectify this, he decided to seek appointment to the municipal court, and if that went well, then to apply for elevation to the spirit court. He was appointed in 1987 and took to judging like a seal to water. He jumped in with both feet and quickly mastered the requirements of being a good trial court judge. Shortly thereafter, he was appointed to the Superior Court. As one would expect, Pete took on the toughest assignments. In the early 90s, we both sat in juvenile court. Pete took on a dependency calendar, which is emotionally the most demanding assignment in any court. I'm reminded of a quote from Pete's favorite political figure, Theodore Roosevelt. Far and away, the best prize that life has to offer is the chance to work hard at work worth doing. Pete achieved that prize in juvenile court. There is no jury, so the judge makes all the decisions, all the critical decisions that determine whether and under what circumstances a child may remain with his or her parents. Pete heard cases all day long and then read a massive stack of files in preparation for the next day's calendar. He was totally dedica dedicated to being fully prepared and to making the best decisions possible in a very emotionally charged arena. He did it with a calm, gentlemanly demeanor that let all the concerned parties know that they had been heard and their position carefully considered. As Teddy Roosevelt also said, courtesy is, a, is as much a mark of a gentleman as courage. Pete was a consummate gentleman with limitless courage, who was courteous to all. Even after he retired, he worked on assignments half-time doing dependency cases. In addition to that, you could find Pete playing games with children in the oncology ward at Rady's Children's Hospital, or serving Thanksgiving dinner to the homeless and taking history courses at UCSD. When Pete married Betsy, it seemed like a match made in heaven but I think was more likely made in the water. <laughs> we were very happy for both of them. As an additional bonus, our food bill dropped substantially. <laughs> they were married for over 20 years. And even though with his disease, 
he insisted on having to renew their vows to mark those 20 years. Hopefully my remarks have given you some insight into five decades of a man loved and admired by many. So Igor, you now have permission to take off that pack. You've carried it well and faithfully. You'll be in our hearts forever. Carry on, Captain Little. <laughs>